I was fortunate to work at LinkedIn for a while uh, as a spokesperson, and I uh, got to connect with some pretty phenomenal people in that role. Uh, I remember the conversation I had with our next speaker about three and a half years ago, and literally she was in New York flying to San Francisco, and I was in San Francisco flying to Michigan, and we had 30 minutes on the uh, plane or on the phone before we got on the plane. And it was one of those conversations, I know you all have had them before, where you feel like every, just, everything just synced, like this was a person you were meant to talk to at that moment. And I, I learned later um, you know, how valuable that conversation was as we developed into friends and helped each other out. What was really cool is uh, I realized how big of a deal she was later, um, which was awesome. Uh, as you saw in the, um, in the notes on her presentation here, she was named by Fast Company uh, the most connected woman in Silicon Valley. Um, what I think is kind of a misnomer on that is she's like one of the most connected people in Silicon Valley. And uh, she's also incredible. Um, she's going to share some of her stories about networking for opportunity. I'll let her go a little bit broader into that. But with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Ellen Levy to the stage. Please put your hands together. Well, thanks, John. I have to say, when I got the call from John, it was an immediate yes just because of our friendship and time working together. Uh, and also because I'd known Brad Feldon, actually worked with him back in 1999 when we were both in venture capital. And then the clincher, actually, John may not know this, is when he told me that if I would come and talk about networking, he would secure Bob Metcalf as my warm up act. <laughs> so, uh, so, but it is fair to say that I've been thinking and been intrigued by the dynamics of social interactions and how they play into the business and workplace for a long time. Whether you consider that I got my PhD in cognitive psychology and thought that I'd never do anything with it, but I was wrong. Or my nearly decade-long involvement working at LinkedIn from when the company was first founded. But probably the single most formative experience that I've had in my background is something very different. And it shaped how I think about networks of people. And I thought I'd start by sharing that experience with you today. So in September, uh, September 23rd of 1999, uh, I actually appeared, it was actually 15 years ago today almost, I appeared on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It's, uh, it was back when people actually read it in paper. And it was what I called the crazy person column, but everyone refers to as the A cut. So in other words, I got my 15 minutes of fame almost 15 years ago for doing something not like a big business accomplishment, but something that at the time was deemed just unusual enough that they thought it was newsworthy. And in 1999, that was that I chronicled my entire life for a year. Now when I say that I chronicled my life for a year, what it means is that I committed to writing a daily journal, and I set up four simple, or at least deceptively simple, rules for myself that I would abide by for the entire year, from January 1st to December 31st of that year. First. Rule number one, I couldn't miss a day. I had to write everything down. Two, I couldn't decide what was important. So that meant trying to capture absolutely everything. I found myself writing down conversations with cab drivers in New York City with the same level of detail that I was writing a conversation I had with Bill Gates and Francis Ford Coppola at a dinner in Las Vegas. Rule number three is I couldn't go back and edit after the fact. I wanted to be genuine and, and the perceptions that I had at that time in the moment. And four, I had to try to take a picture of everyone I met. So not only did I not miss a single day the entire year, and I never once left home without my camera, but what resulted is a corpus of about 3,000 single space type pages, a collection of almost 1,800 photos, and an entirely different way of looking at the world that has stuck with me ever since uh, I did that project, even though so much has changed since then. But remember, at least for those of you who can remember back to 1999 and recall, it was the peak of the internet heyday, right? which has been renamed the internet bubble. But in the, that time, it was the heyday. And, uh, and a lot was different back then, especially in the context of the project that I was trying to do. So keep in mind, there was no digital photography to speak of. I mean, you could get a digital camera, but you were lucky if it was a two megapixel camera. So I shot all of my pictures on film. I didn't even know if the pictures had worked. I took them into a camera store with my little canister. I waited a couple days. I got the photos back. I mean, et cetera. You, you get the idea. There were no smartphones. You were actually pretty avant-garde if you had one of the Nextel flip phones so you could do push to talk with one of your friends. There was no blogging, no wikis, no liking, no viral sharing, et cetera. And there was definitely no LinkedIn, no Facebook, nothing that could help you keep track of your friends, your colleagues, and others. Those were still four or five years away from the making. So I mentioned all that 
because what was a pretty daunting task back then would be infinitely easier in today's world. And that's a theme that I'll get back to later. But for now, I thought I'd do, uh, mo before moving on to a broader topic of networking, is share some of my impressions, both from doing the journal and the experience, but also what I've gone through in the last week or two when I went back and I reread the month of entries that I did for September exactly 15 years ago. And I should mention, it was the first time I had gone back and reread them since doing it. Um, and in fact, a lot of ways, it was like immersing myself in the experience all over again with a new mindset. So to add a bit of context, I should mention that during that time, I was an entrepreneur for the first nine months of that year working at an ebook startup, think the Kindle, but 15 years ago. Uh, and then it was eventually acquired. I then spent several weeks in a job transition, trying to decide whether I was gonna go co-found a company with some friends, join a couple startups where I was already on their advisory boards, or switch over to being a venture capitalist. And I should note, even back then, it was called going to the dark side, um, which eventually I did decide to do the latter. And for the last three months of the year, I was a venture capitalist at a firm called SoftBank Venture Capital. So it was very much the world of entrepreneurship and startups, and admittedly, not a typical everyday experience, but probably one that is quite relevant and quite familiar to all of you in this room. So with that as a bit of context, I figured I'd share a couple of the impressions that I took away from that experience. The first impression is that without a doubt, simply that I interacted with a lot of people. Right? When I did the count for the month of all the people that I had directly interacted with, and I defined that as either I met with them, I bumped into them in person, or I spoke with them on the phone, it turned out that that was 287 distinct people, or what we call uniques, right? Furthermore, when I counted the number of people that I was trying to keep track of, either by discussing or referencing them in the journal at some point during that month, that count turned out to be over 350 people. Long story short, in a lot of ways, my journal turned out to be a documentary of sorts about people who came and went from my life. In fact, I even noted back then that it felt a lot like I was trying to start to map the six degrees of separation of people. You know, I'll give an example. I was constantly referencing that somebody I met's brother was a colleague of a friend who went to college with my sis, et cetera. Right? Like it was constantly this notation of how everybody was connected to the best of my ability. But back then, it's very clear that I felt like I was doing detective work, right? That I had discovered these secrets. Whereas in today's world, those are the sorts of insights that are at your fingertips if you look for them. But not only were there a ton of examples like that of how people were connected both in obvious and non-obvious ways, but there are also examples of how information could flow through those networks. For example, I documented how a startup I was helping co-found called the Dr. Spot Company went in to pitch the partners at Kleiner Perkins. After learning that they, Kleiner Perkins, were actively considering investment in another similar company that was likely to be competitive, so we were trying to be preemptive and get in there and talk. Not so novel, except for the fact that I can describe how we learned of their intentions. It was because one of my co-founders had been at a friend's wedding in Monaco, of all places, and the uncle of the bride happened to be a venture capitalist who was also looking at that deal with Kleiner Perkins. <coughs> So not only have I probably just reinforced each and every one of your suspicion that VCs do talk, but more importantly, the point I'm trying to make is that what used to be a very serendipitous discovery of information is also now something that's become readily discoverable if you choose to look for it through social platforms and other technologies. In any event, the second impression that I had from the experience, it's that it took a lot of time and a lot of effort. And by that I mean both the process of actually interacting with people in genuine and meaningful ways, but also just the act of tracking all this information. In looking back, it was clear that being an entrepreneur and then a VC was an all-consuming activity. My meals, my workout time, my social activities were all inextricably mixed with my work. Basically, there was little or no distinction between my work and my social life. Interestingly, looking back on it, it now appears much more that I was laying the foundation for many long-lasting relationships uh, that have impacted my life. Or said differently, connections that I would come to rely on in the future that I didn't even realize were gonna be so important. And when I think of those interactions, it's not just about thinking of them as tactical actions I was taking to get some business need met, but that those relationships were in fact incredibly important, I just didn't know it. Just to give one example of a person, and again, there were many, Take the case of my then former colleague, a guy named Sean White. Right? And I don't mean the snowboarder Sean White, for those of you thinking that. Uh, I mean a fellow Stanford alum who had already been a colleague of mine 
first when we both worked at a technology think tank in, in the Bay Area called Interval Research, and then when I had recruited him to be the CTO of the first startup that I was at. But in 1999, Sean had just gotten married and was thinking about stepping back and leaving being an entrepreneur and startup life to go and travel with his new wife for six months. But let me take you forward what happened since then. Four years later, I recruited him to be our technology in residence at the venture fund that I had just created, helped create and joined. Nine years later, he was actually the person who officiated my wedding. And if you fast forward 15 years to today, he's now one of my closest friends and an investor in his current startup. With respect to the tracking process, having just gotten a full sense back in 1999 of how hard it was to do manually over the course of the year of journaling, it's not hard to see why when something like LinkedIn came along, I got so excited from day one. And that was just one of the many propositions of LinkedIn. It's also why more recently, I've gotten very excited about startups like Newsle. Actually, a show of hands. How many people know of the service Newsle, which most of you call Newsly, but it's actually Newsle? Anybody? <laughs> Right? It's a service that gives you information or news about people in your network. It gives you the information about what's going on without you having to do anything other than identify who matters to you and what you want to keep track of. It's also why I'm a fan of companies like a startup called A Company, which should launch later this year, that's focused on providing a personal CRM solution that meets the demands of today's much more connected, much more information-rich world. But that's a bunch of other issues that we can talk about later if you like. Inevitably, at this point in the conversation, I almost always get some, actually a really thoughtful follow-up question where people ask that, isn't it true the fact that these tools that we now have today that are automating so many of these processes actually make relationships less important? I'm being spoon-fed all the information. I'm taking away all the personal touch. It's just right there for everybody. Um, and in fact, what it means is that we're depersonalizing the situation and making relationships less important. And what I always say to that is that the answer is no, and in fact, quite the contrary. The way I look at it, the fact that everyone has access to these tools that reduce so much of the burden of tracking and discovering information, and even some that remind you when it would be nice to reach out to somebody. What's interesting is that those basically mean that actual relationships are what matter, not the information about the relationship. Let me see if I can make a point by doing a really simple example. For those of you who can remember when cell phones first became kind of part of everyday business use, do you remember what happened? Most people, especially senior executives, would only give their cell phone number out to the purple people in their inner circle. Right? You could only give it to a couple of people. So if you had my cell phone number, just the sheer act of you having it meant that we probably had a good relationship. Right? Today, probably everyone and their mother could and probably does have your cell phone number. We stick it on business cards. It's everywhere. All of a sudden, the way I think about it, the denominator got really big. Everybody can have that. It's what happens in the numerator. So in my analogy, think about it. Everyone can call my cell phone. It's what I do when I see your name pop up on the caller ID that defines whether the relationship's real and what it means to both sides. Okay. So moving to the last impression, and this was a particularly strong one. It's that sometimes the seemingly inconsequential turns out to be anything but, especially when it comes to the people that you meet that could influence your career and your life, often in very unexpected ways. And with the takeaway being that it's investing time in relationships before you know exactly how valuable the, they'll be, that's important. This is particularly worthwhile, and I'll pause on it for a moment, and I want to note this, because in today's world, you're often cutting this activity off your list. There's so much demand to be thinking about immediate ROI from every action you're taking. I want to know why you're sitting in this conference today. Why are you spending this hour here? Sometimes you have to start thinking about relationships as a series of long-term investments where any moment in time you can't quite tell how or why they'll pay off. So probably the best example I can give in this theme that we're working on about this serendipitous and inconsequential turning out to be consequential is to give you the story of how I actually ended up on the cover of that Wall Street Journal back in 1999. So on March 23rd of that year, I was on a flight from JFK back to San Francisco after having had a series of business meetings. And it wasn't even a flight I was supposed to be on. It turns out that there'd been a mechanical that day, and so I'd switched flights and I was on this new flight. And I ended up sitting next to somebody on the plane. We all sit next to people on the plane. We either ignore them or we talk to them and we forget what we talked about nine times out of 10. Well, on this particular day, I was sitting next to a guy, a businessman named Todd, and somewhere mid-flight, I told him a little bit about my journal project, what I was doing, got his permission and asked the flight attendant, would you mind taking our picture? And of course, as almost always happened when I did that during the year, 
Um, I thought of it as just them using it the novelty, but I think they were probably thinking they wanted to understand my compulsiveness. We ended up speaking for 10 more minutes or so about what it was exactly that I was doing and why was I doing it. And then I never saw or spoke to that person again. Okay. But what happened was Todd apparently went home to New York City after his meetings were over. He told a colleague about some woman who was chronicling her life for a year. That person told a friend at a party in New York City, and that woman happened to be an up-and-coming journalist covering Latin America for the Wall Street Journal. She decided to hunt me down, and six months to the day after I had sat next to Todd on the airplane, the story ran on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Now, I had the luxury of figuring out that that happened because of my journal, but if you think about the people you are touching, it's a pretty poignant example of you don't know where it can come from, so you have to live in the moment, but realize that these relationships are real, and sometimes you can't anticipate how they will play out. And while I could go on and on, I figure I should switch gears, at least about the journal, um, I could switch gears and talk a little bit about some of my other impressions about the powers of networks and relationships in the context of what I learned and thought about when I was at LinkedIn, and then even today, what I'm doing as an angel investor, an advisory board member working with startups, some of which are in this category that I call social productivity. Right, so in the context of LinkedIn, I'm gonna, well, actually, I was gonna say I'm gonna assume that you're all on it, just for old time's sake. Can I see how many people have a profile on LinkedIn? Right, so this used to be such a depressing question five or six years ago, right? Like, in a room like this, I might see half the hands go up, and to make myself feel better, I'd say, okay, how many of you are on Facebook? And maybe 30% would raise their hand, and I'd say, how many of you are on Twitter? And they'd say 10%, so at least we were winning. But, but to the point that I'm trying to make, what's interesting is that today we've gotten to a point where we take for granted LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. They're there, they're tools we can use, we can learn information about people at a moment's notice. But even with that pervasive familiarity that we have today, I find that sometimes people haven't really had the chance to step back and think about how to fully harness the potential that systems like LinkedIn have. So to bring it to life, what I thought I would do is actually add a little bit of a quantitative section to my slide, uh, to my talk, because if nothing else, I know people seem to like to have data every so often. So the first data set that I'm gonna describe is the one that simply characterizes my network by the numbers. And for full disclosure, this analysis is something that I had done when I was at LinkedIn, so it's a couple years old, but the points that it makes, I think, hold true every bit as much today, just with a different data set. So the data scientists and I sat down and we asked a bunch of questions about my network and how to characterize it. And at the time we were doing that analysis, I was connected to 1,600 people. So that was my first degree network. And that in turn yielded 452,000 second degree connections. And that in turn yielded 15.5 million third degree connections. So think about it. Next time you ask somebody, do you know so-and-so? If they've switched to what I now call thinking in the third degree, it's an entirely different story and different answer. In fact, when I was looking at this with the data scientists, I wanted to explore that and I asked them, let me ask a simple question. Let's just pretend, hypothetically, that I wanted to get to somebody at each of the Fortune 100 companies, anybody at the company. How many of those companies could I touch through my first degree, my second degree, my third degree? And what was amazing to us, and actually quite surprising, even for those of us who were living and breathing network theory at the time, was how much we were actually to see that I had pretty comprehensive coverage just in my second degree. I'd always figured by the third degree, yeah, sure, you got somebody everywhere. But in the second degree, we saw the impact. Let me give you the numbers. In my first degree network of 1,600 people, I knew at least one person at 28 of the Fortune 100 companies. But if you just went out to my second degree network, I could reach at least one person at 96 of the Fortune 100 companies. Or said differently, I had over 31,000 people in my second degree network who worked at one of those 96 companies. And if you went to my third degree, I could reach at least one person at 98% of those companies, taking into consideration the 880,000 people who collectively worked at one of those companies. So we figured, let's run the test again, and the pattern held. We tested and we asked, what if I did it with the Fortune 500? There, the first degree got me to 10% of the companies. The second degree, 91%. And then the third degree, up to 98% again, almost complete coverage. So we tried to make it even harder. We asked, what about if I was trying to reach somebody at the Bombay Stock Exchange 30, which honestly I had never even heard of. But we looked it up, we got the list of 30 companies, and I said, how many people in my network could I get to? Now, as much as it wasn't as complete or, uh, coverage or uh, penetration in my second degree network, it was still pretty impressive, especially considering I literally didn't even know the names of the companies, never mind have any direct experiences with them. So in my first degree, turns out I could get to 7% or two out of the 30 companies through two people that I knew. 
In my second degree, there was 63% coverage. I could get to 19 of the 30 companies through 608 people. And in my third degree, again, back to 97%. That's 29 companies uh, through 64,000 different people. And to just test this pattern and not just keep doing this list of companies, we decided to shift and look at it in a different way. What about my global reach? What if we looked country by country and asked, what does a network do and how can you navigate the globe, literally? Uh, and instead of showing you the list of every country and all the data we looked at, let me just pull out two examples that I think make very different and interesting points that we found. So if you remember, I had 1,600 connections at the time we did this analysis. Of those, 1,400 or so of the people lived in the United States. Right, so that's 90% of my network. I was very US-centric in terms of the way I had built primary relationships and then put them onto LinkedIn. And so when we went to analyze my network and we looked out to the third degree, what was stunning at the time was that if you looked at my third degree network, I could reach 24% of all LinkedIn members from the US on the site at the time. That's one out of every four people in the US who was on LinkedIn based in the US were in my third degree network. But take a different example different point altogether. We then looked at Brazil. At the time, I had no connections in Brazil, none, right? But if I went to the third degree, I had over 180,000 connections, right? And it's observations like this that we started making that really started to make it clear to me that thinking in the third degree can be wildly transformative. And when I keep saying the third degree, remember, you only get to the third degree if you have a good, robust first degree. So it's not to trivialize that first part of networking, it's then what the benefits are and how they accrue to you. So let me take that Brazil example a little further to make two more points. The first thing is, let me just give you an example. Imagine today that we work at a very large company and the company decides to announce that as a strategic move for the next year, we're gonna focus on entering new markets. And the market that we're gonna enter is Brazil, right? And I work in strategy, so I think this is great. Except if I'm living in my first degree world, I have no connections in Brazil, which usually signifies I don't know much about Brazil, haven't been there, et cetera, because you would infer that I probably have connections. But the interesting thing is, that means if I'm the person sitting at the company and want to be able to, on a moment's notice, shift how I think and who I work with, if I'm in my first degree world, I'm stuck. But if I'm in my thir third degree world and leveraging that as the way I do business and think about my interactions, I have a lot of threads I can go pull the day that we announce that new initiative. Okay, so what's interesting to me there is that, one, I didn't have any connections in, in Brazil. Now, truth be told, I actually did have connections in Brazil at the time. And it was a really clear reminder to me to go and connect to the people on LinkedIn. So you may have connections, but as you bring them into these new technology platforms, whether it's LinkedIn or it's the Connect service I saw that you were all talking about this morning, if they aren't instantiated in these networks, it's as if they exist either in a parallel universe or they're inaccessible in these ways that are now enabling you to do so many things. But the second thing about it was that it made me realize that if I were in the situation, I'd want to be a little more deliberate about how to go about making those connections. So right about this time, again, I try to project a little bit about what you might be thinking because I've done some of these talks before. A lot of people say, yeah, that's all well and good, except for the fact you're assuming that we think the second and third degree are actually valuable. Right? And I get that comment enough that I think it actually stems from some of the ways that in the early days when these services came out, people started using them and shortchanging themselves on what the value might be. So for me, when you ask this question about whether the second or third degree really matters, that's when the real guiding principle will come out. And what that means, or in my case, the principle is that if you actually are connecting to people that you know, you trust, and that would interact with you, either do something uh, so that you'd interact with, either you'd do something for them, or if you asked properly in the right set of context and et cetera, they would do something for you, then yes, I actually think the second and third degree matter, in fact, they matter a lot. It's not just a game of claiming how many connections I have versus you, and it's certainly not about just clicking accept every time somebody sends you a random connection request and you don't even know who they are, right? That's a superficial first step, but it doesn't get you to the value in the second and third degree. So it's for those reasons that I actually take building and cultivating relationships so seriously. I try, when I get a connection request from somebody I know, to write back thoughtfully and say, I like to connect to people who I know and I can do justice to so that if and when I, you reach out to me, I could serve you well. Now, of course, I don't write it, but the reverse holds true too, which is if you don't know me, what value is that also? But thinking about it as cultivating a network where you want to make sure that those value propositions hold and it's kind of an implicit agreement is incredibly important. 
So to give one concrete example that I expect every one of you has either used or thinks about or has utilized in the last week, month, um, think about the time that you sent out an email saying, does anybody know somebody at this company or does anybody know this particular person? Right? You might have sent the email to your investors, to your board, to the Techstars network. You're trying to reach somebody. In a third degree world way of thinking about it, that question would read more like, do you know so this person, so and so? And if you don't, do you know anybody who could help me get to that person? And it's amazing, it sounds kind of like a nice generic formula, it's amazing the number of times I get those requests when I'm working with a company on their advisory board, where I can start to do a search of the, search of the company, of the, the executives on the team, so maybe I don't know the chief marketing officer, but I know the chief technology officer. Probably they talk once in a while. Right? So, so you start to realize that traversing your network is incredibly powerful as a resource that you can lean on. And you don't actually have to take my word for it or look very far. Just think about the entire category of tool that's being created now that's often called the, the social selling tools um, that are out there. LinkedIn has its sales navigator product. There's lead space for looking up who's the right person and who do you know at a company to make the connection that's most likely to result in a sale, et cetera. This is something now that people are starting to harness, but it's all predicated on having quality relationships and quality networks. Simply put, I no longer think in terms of who I know, but rather who I know and who they know. And by extension, and very importantly, who would I like to know? How can I get to know them better? And why would they want to know me? All important pieces to your strategy around thinking about your relationships. And with that, I figure what I'll do to wrap up is quickly run through a list of what I call kind of networking principles. Or you can think of it as kind of a cheat sheet for what I rely on when I'm in everyday interactions or when I'm evaluating products and services that claim they're going to facilitate social interactions. So principle number one, it's going to be obvious, but the worst time to build a relationship is when you need something. Right? I often I'll throw in a tagline, that's called a transaction. Um, but I suspect, like we give an example, we all know that person who you get a phone call from them and it doesn't matter if they talk to you for two minutes or for two hours, you know at some point they're going to ask you for something because that's the only time they call. Right? Remember, we all have those people. And it's not even that you don't think of them as a friend or that you're not willing to help, but I bet you or I, I bet you money that you don't think of it as a deeply touching relationship that you could rely on. Right? So reaching out only when you need something is the worst way to try to build a relationship. Think of it as a recommendation, this principle, to take the time to reinforce relationship when you have nothing immediate to gain. In fact, it's even better when it's so painfully clear there's nothing in it for you. People almost think they're suspicious. They're like, why are you doing this? Right? We've grown so accustomed that it's an immediate quid pro quo that if you start shifting to this model saying, no, I just wanted to help, it's, a, it's an impressively powerful way of thinking about working with relationships. So in other words, just don't invest in a relationship at the last minute when you need something. Give an example. These are everyday actions. If I started to tag everything in the world with a lens of, of social networking, they happen all around you. It's the investor or advisor or serial entrepreneur who's very successful in the room who decides to tweet out something about you or your company when something good happens. And they can lend their credibility to you just with a little tweet. Right? That's helping somebody, showing you're thinking about them, and doing something that takes very little of your time and could actually be very influential for somebody else. Or it's taking the time to forward a piece of information that you think the other person might appreciate. You know, I do this all the time. I see a product launch from another company that I think my startup should know about. When I send that information, it's not just that I'm a news clipping service. It's that that person, I'd argue, underlying it, has to think she stopped and she thought about me, and she's trying to put my interest in mind to even know what to send me. Now, I might miss the target. That's OK. Delete's pretty easy to hit. Right? But the idea that I've actually gone and spent that time is something that I think underpins all good relationships. In fact, even in those emails, I take the time to write, by the way, absolutely not necessary to reply, just sent it along in case helpful, so that there's no obligation to do anything back. You just think I was doing it in case it was helpful. So principle number two, conversely, one of the best times to build a relationship or strengthen a relationship is when somebody needs something, when it matters to somebody else and you take the time to help them. So from the journal, if you think back to 1999, this was never more apparent than when I was counting the number of people I had interactions with back in that month of September 15 years ago. And I realized that over 10% of all of my interactions that month involved primarily people looking for new jobs in the middle of a career change. Right? It's the time when you can make a massive impact on somebody else's life and show that you care about them. Right? There were some other people who were asking for introductions to VCs and to potential business partners, et cetera, but that job change piece 
is a really critical one. In fact, if you fast forward just a couple of years to when LinkedIn was started, it's not surprising that the first mechanism that primed the pump for the company, in fact, it primed it so much so that for years a lot of people would just call us a job site, was this notion of matching people two people, one looking for a job and one looking for an employee, and letting a third person help facilitate that process. Right? If you think about it, it's a pretty simple situation. The two people are matched, and the third person is able to help, making a very meaningful impact on at least one, if not both, of the people they're helping. Right? One example of the way that you can constantly be helping your network, and to the extent that tools and services exist to make it as easy as possible for you, it's amazingly helpful, and it doesn't take a lot to do. And that gets me to that third principle. When asking something of a relationship, a person you know, work to make it as compelling and as easy as possible for the person to actually say yes. Right? Sometimes you have people with every good intention, but it's just so hard that they can't do it for you. Right? Let me give you an example. You know, like in the job example I just gave, it is a pretty straightforward one. And in the case of LinkedIn utilizing this, it's one that people typically do. Right? Even if it does take work, we kind of realize, like, but if I were ever looking for a job, I'd want people to help me. So we kind of go along with it. Right? But there's a lot of things that we ask for of other people where that's not the case. And I think you really do have to think about some of the very basic issues. Are you asking yourself, like, did you consider what's in it for the other person when you wrote them? Or did you just give them the ask? And quite frankly, I'm a big advocate of, look, if there's nothing in it for me and you're just asking me, you go, hey, I'm calling it honestly, I just need a favor. Right? Like, don't try to sugarcoat it. Don't say, no, it's really good for you. you know, if it's not, make sure you know that you're asking something of somebody and that you appreciate what they're giving you to do it. Are you asking for a lot of their time? That certainly hurts your chances. In order for the person to help you, does, she or, does he or she have to do all the work? Right? Or did you take as much off their plate as possible? Now, this may all sound obvious, but it is incredible to me, incredible to me Every day, the little actions that people take, where when I react going, well, that was weird, they just did that to me, I realize that what's underpinning it is they're violating these basic rules. Right? I'm going to give you an example here. And this is one from a LinkedIn invitation to connect that, uh, that reads something like what follows. In fact, I'm actually going to read it to you verbatim. It's one that I received the other day. It simply read, Ellen, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. We both know, and then they named a person. More importantly, I read about you in Feminomics, which I had no idea what that was, but 105 women venture capitalists and angel investors you should know. You will be a fabulous, in all capitals, resource for me. <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't connect, right? So <laughs> principle number four, and admittedly, it's an extension of number three. When dealing with social interactions, or in some cases, if you're running a company and you're designing tools, social tools and services, Design for the person who has something, not the person who needs something. Right, so I'm going to say that again, because it's definitely counterintuitive. Design your service or make your ask thinking about the person who has something, not the person who needs something. Right, here's what I mean. Typically, if you think about a product, there's somebody, potential customer, they need something. You build your product, you put it in front of them, they either buy it, they like it, they use it. Something indicates they like it, and you're done. But it's not the same when it's a social system. Right, when social, in my term, is more than one person's involved. Because now you're dealing with people dynamics more than you are the features that are involved in whether somebody paid money for it. Okay, so let me bring up an example, see if this works. How many of you at least have been exposed to the service Plaxo? Do you remember the address book service Plaxo? Yeah, I see it didn't get very far. So here's why, in my opinion. Very simple violation of a principle that I'm talking about. Okay, so Plaxo, address book. I could go and I could say, I want to keep track of all my contacts. Wouldn't it be awesome if whenever I got a contact, I could put the name in and either it would have the information about the person already or it would go out and ask the person to fill it in for me. So let's take an example here. You're an incredibly prominent person here at this conference. I get to meet you for two minutes. I am wildly excited. I go back home and I'm like, I'm going to put this person in my contacts because that's the step to building a relationship. And uh, that's extra color commentary. That's not really my point. But, but I, I put that in and what would Plaxo do next? Plaxo would fire off an email to you. And it'd say, please enter all your contact information. Right? It's a perfect example of putting the burden on exactly the wrong person. You don't care if you've got, you know, that I've got your contact information. In fact, you probably wish I didn't if you've talked to 500 people that day. Right? So it's amazing how I can tell these truisms. They sound like little nice platitudes. But if you look at day-to-day -day interactions, they happen all around you. So let me give you an example of how it's done right. And again, I keep going to LinkedIn examples because I know them well, but you can think of your own along the way. Think of the LinkedIn request and introduction feature. Right? So that's the feature that's definitely a social tool. Three people are involved. Let's call it first person is person A. And there's the person 
who needs something, in this case, an introduction. Right? Person B is the one who has something to offer, in this case, a connection. And then that person's connection is to what I call person C. Pretty simple, right? You've all seen it before. Now remember, before LinkedIn, even if person B wanted to help, needed no convincing whatsoever, here's what he still had to do. He had to remember how to describe person A. He had to remember the context in which he discussed with person A what the introduction request was about, or sorry, why he was asking. And if it weren't enough, person B also had to remember what exactly it was that person A wanted to talk to person C about, right? So it was a lot to ask of person B when you weren't even trying to convince them to help you, you were just giving them the task at hand. Right? So with LinkedIn's introduction request, as you've no doubt noticed, I suspect most of you have used it, the only thing person B, the person who has something, needs to do is consider adding a quick note to person C saying why he thought it was worth sending along the information that person A had forwarded. Okay? In other words, the heavy lifting is done by the person who needs something. Not a hard problem to ask somebody to solve for. If you want something, you're hungry, you'll do it. It's me that you have to worry about if I'm the one who's just trying to lend my, my services to that person. So while the system was, in LinkedIn's case, by design, tuned to make it as frictionless, easy, and hopefully sometimes rewarding for the person who had something to contribute. Quite simply, I think of it as enabling social capital to flow in the right direction instead of trying to push it up a hill. And the last principle, principle number five, and this one isn't really so much a principle, it's just an observation of where we are today. It's that up until recently, if you, if you were someone who was taking advantage of all the tools and services that I describe or that are put at your disposal through Techstars, et cetera, I would have said that you were putting yourself at a distinct advantage. Now, with the one caveat, you'd have to be using them thoughtfully. It's not just having the tools, but using them thoughtfully. But in a world that's now gotten more and more connected and more and more enabled through these technologies, tapping the potential in your network is no longer just advantageous. I'd argue that it's becoming imperative. We're now at a point where I think it's fair to say that if you aren't thoughtfully engaging your network in ways like those I've been describing, you're going to be at a distinct disadvantage. I don't think there's going to be much more time before you can walk in a room and have an excuse for why you don't know about me before you sit down to talk to me. In some cases, you've already hit that point, but it's coming soon for the masses. Right, so to wrap up this talk, what I, you know, and hopefully leave a couple minutes for some Q&A, I saved two messages for the end because I think of them more as like overarching universal truths that have held constant through all of my explorations and these experiences I've been talking about. And the first one is that when all is said and done, it comes down to time. Right? It's the one resource that we can't make more of, at least not yet. Right? That just means that how you allocate your time and to whom becomes incredibly important. And often when I say that, a lot of people look like, OK, great, yes, time management, it's a skill I should learn, et cetera. That's not what I mean at all. Like I'm talking about something very different. In the context of relationships, I'd argue that underlying most interactions is the giving and taking of time. And that that's what defines relationships, and more importantly, the value you place on the relationship. For example, simple little one that I can give you now. Think back 15 years ago. I remember marveling at the fact that somebody remembered my birthday and put a physical birthday card in the mail for me. That doesn't happen anymore. But even when I get a bunch of posts on my Facebook wall, even then, I'm intrigued and impressed and thought, uh, thinking about it because I know if just for a couple seconds, it meant that somebody on the other end stopped and thought about me and then went back about their day. I will also tell you that when I get that batch of emails on my birthday at 12.01 AM, I don't think anything of them. Right? That those are the ones that I know were generated by some automated service, and I don't even know if you know that you sent me the thing. Right? To take the LinkedIn example, so I only give positive examples on LinkedIn, Think about the LinkedIn connection request. You know, the, the email that I think some of you have seen that says, I'd like to connect with you on LinkedIn, and it says nothing more, right? I'm gonna bet, again, bet some money here, that every time you receive one of those, your first thought is not, wow, isn't that awesome? This person thought to reach out to me. If you're like me, my first thought is, does this person even know they sent me this, or did LinkedIn just get a hold of their address book? Right? It's about the intentionality and the fact that you took time to think about me, and in better cases, you thought about me and what my interests are, not what your interests are. Okay? The second key message, and it's going to be a short one, but I will tell you it's a little more philosophical, is it's about approaching the experience we're talking about, the experience while you're in it, and appreciating the time you have with the people that you're in it with. So back in 1999, the person that I interacted with more than any other single person that entire year was a guy named Jim Sachs. He was the founder and CEO of the, of the startup that I told you I worked at, that ebook company called Softbook Press, that was ultimately acquired by Gemstar. 
And to say he was like a kid in a candy store with the level of enthusiasm he had for what we were doing would be an understatement. So I mentioned Jim because shortly after Softbook was acquired, and Jim was a newly minted millionaire many, many times over, he was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and died less than two years later. So although it's really sobering, and I'm sorry for that, uh, I wanted to end with the comment that the most important thing to remember when thinking about your interactions is not just how to maximize the business value you derive from the relationships now or in the future, but to be sure that you appreciate the time you're spending with people along the way. And so with that, I'm gonna end by just saying thank you for spending some time with me today. All right, thank you, Ellen. Uh, I'm gonna save you from yourself because we're gonna get into Q&A and you're gonna be uh, on stage for a while. All right. Ellen is going to uh, hang out in the hallway for 10 minutes or so. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, she's gotta run to the uh, airport and literally have a cab out front uh, set to take care of her. So if you wanna carry the conversation, one, she told you how to connect with her going forward, gave you the formula. Uh, two, she'll be out in the hallway for a little bit. So one awesome. more time, please put your hands together for Ellen Levy. Thank you.